Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the blessings and the opportunity to be here, the freedom to come and open your word. We ask now, Lord, that you would bless not only this session, but the next, and that you would uh, guide this country in a strong way. Lord, give us the, the conviction to stand on your word, to hear your word, and more importantly, to do your word. We come forth, we ask you to open our ears and our hearts to hear your word and to look forward into the latter days that you have pa planned for us. We thank you, and it is in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as you can see, we're going to be talking about and finishing, I hope, the pandemic, power, and the parousia. And of course, parousia means what? Coming. coming. The coming of Christ. And so... The question that I lay before you and have laid before you in the first two sessions is this. How does the pandemic prepare the world for the latter days? For the latter, and that means the coming of Christ. And I believe it does. I think it's shaping us. It's shaping our world in many ways that are visible and that we can look at the Bible and we can see the Bible and what it says, and we can see our world starting to fall into more of a pattern that we see. Because a lot of things we said, how could the world ever get to that position that would accept these kind of things? So we've looked at a few things coming up to this session, session one, session two, and now we'll conclude uh, with a few more items and then ultimately the coming of Christ. Now, in the first two sessions, I'll just give you a quick review here. Uh, we looked at the biblical use of disease, and that's by God. And we've so seen that it was used by God for judgment. And we wonder if God is judging the world now in a, in a way. We certainly deserve it, don't we? Our country, we do. And so it has been used as by God for judgment. It's been used by God to move a people to repentance. Certainly we are qualified to repent before God because of our sins. It's been used by God to move people. It was used to move the people in Egypt out into the promised land. And we've seen pestilence today, how it's been used to move people around the globe, primarily back to their own countries, their own states. And we know that from our passages on eschatology, pestilence is a sign. It's a sign of the end. Christ called it the beginning of sorrows, beginning of birth pains. And so as we see these pestilences uh, draw up, uh, we will note and we'll think Christ must be coming soon. I read just this morning or, or last night that there's another COVID influenza, brand new one. Couldn't believe it. They're calling it a COVID, influ COVID flu. And so, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that this kind of thing is happening. This is just heightening our awareness that Christ is coming soon. And that should give us hope as we look forward. Not gloom and doom that the rest of the world says, but hope because these are signs that Christ is coming soon. We've seen from the reaction to pandemic disease that Fear is a great motivator. Fear can make people do things they never thought they would do before. And we've seen that. And, and we could go through a list, and I won't. You know, things like stay home, things like wear a face mask, uh, just a variety of things that, that can happen. But fear does that. And we learn that fear is not an aspect of a Christian life. We do not fear whatever's in it. We don't fear the pestilence. We are concerned and will take steps to prevent it as best we can. But we're not going to sit here cowering in our homes wondering what's going on. We have a greater one who can conquer fear. We've seen isolation. How that weakens a society. Went through the various aspects of how that, does, how that works. And so that's not an accident because it's preparing a people. We've seen how the church and the world has reacted to church, and we've seen it particularly in our country where we never thought we'd see it before. Stay closed. Even now there are churches that are still closed. We've had to weigh the government's mandates to close 
to God's word. And I think we showed clearly last time we met on this subject that church is essential. And we need to be meeting and supporting and that without the physical meeting it is very difficult, if not impossible, to minister to one another as Christ has laid out in his word. We saw that deceit and lies are now almost becoming normalized. By normalized, I mean it doesn't bother us anymore. Oh yeah, he lied about this, he lied about that, but you know, that's okay. We're accepting things that are not true, and we can see from the Bible that deceit will be running rampant in the last days. This is one of the tools of Satan to deceive the people, to lie to them, and it sets up the end time. And lastly, we saw that we got to take hold and we got to stand firm in the sovereignty of God. He's in control. His providence means that he's dictating, he's moving, he's guiding, he's, the whole process is his. And so we need to be confident in that, that what is happening in the world is not going against his will, it's not going against his plan, it's part of his plan. And for that we are thankful. We are living at a time that no other culture or society has ever lived. Believe firmly, as a lot of people do, that we are on the edge, the very edge of the coming last days or what we call the latter days. And that should be exciting. The whole new world awaits us, but not until we go through a few minor inconveniences. <laughs> Well, let's continue and now look at a few more items that I think the pandemic has brought about, and this one I call the economic crisis. I think that's self-explanatory. We look around our world today, and we can see what the pandemic has done to the economies of the world. We've had lockdowns where people are shut in their homes and businesses are closed. People are unemployed and a loss of income for many, many people. What has that done to the world? It's created food shortages. It's been a long, long time since I've walked in a grocery store and saw so many empty slots, and we still do. There are holes where products should be. There's, there's shortages of certain categories of food. Toilet paper. Toilet paper, a big one, yeah. <laughs> Not food, but necess necessities. And even Christians are wondering, what are we going to do? There's definitely hoarding going on. People buying up stocks of food as if that's going to prevent, you know, all of the things that are about to happen. But it's creating a, a, a massive problem in the economy. It's showing a people in crisis or preparing for even a worse crisis. You know, all kinds of things on the show. Limits. Went in a store and they said you can only have four cans of green beans. Like, I only have five. Well, you have to put one back. <laughs> I'm like, okay, is this just the beginning? Where food is that scarce that I need to be concerned? What am I going to do? Well, it depend on Christ. He will take care of you. Also, the monetary disruptions that we've had. The money systems. Even now you go into stores and we don't take coins. They might have the COVID on it. They might have the disease on it. And so, you know, there's all, been all kinds of talk. What are we going to do? We can't keep handing money around. And, and, and uh, you know what's coming. You know what's coming. And people have been talking about paperless systems and we're heading in that direction. I don't know if you've heard of something called cryptocurrency. Bitcoin. This is a big one, but there are more than just the Bitcoin. Bitcoin's the biggest one. Do you know that in the last tax bill, the one that contained the stimulus checks, that one of the versions was calling for people to get paid in cryptocurrency? $1,200 each in cryptocurrency. That was scratched out at the, at the last moment, but that's the beginning, even in this country of people having to go and figure out how to cash in something like that and use it. But it's not coming, it's in the far distant, it's gonna be the near distant future. Countries 
are debating on whose cryptocurrency is going to rule. Who's going to be the basis? The U.S. dollar has always been the strong basis and foundation for the world. But what will it be in the future? So that topic has come up quite a bit. And you know it reminds us of this verse. Talking about the false prophet and the, and the Antichrist. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, that's everybody, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And I highlighted mm -hmm. verse 17, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of the name. So I think we can see clearly that the pandemic is pushing us in that direction. It's preparing us as a world that we're almost going to demand something like this. But it will be the Antichrist who will take it and use it for his plans and ultimately God's purposes. We won't be able to buy or sell as a society and as a world unless we pledge allegiance to the beast. We talked about that last time. Will fear drive many people in that direction? But we're being set up to accept it. Food shortages. These food shortages have caused quite a stir in the world. And the people that are being affected the most are the poor. We have had famines, and we have always had famines, but this pandemic has exponentially exploded the number of people who are starving in the world. The hungry are becoming hungrier in the world. Matthew 24, 7, part of the Olivet Discourse. Christ said this, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against nation, and there will be famines. Famines. We're seeing it. We're seeing it increase like we've never seen it increase. Perhaps even double what it was before. There's some estimates. Double. I just saw a news story yesterday that said Yemen, of all places, 25% of the kids under five are starving in Yemen. And the number is exploding daily. They're not the only country. They're just the one I caught my attention. It is going across the globe. Travel has been shut down. People have been going. Food sources have been stopped. Our shelves, yeah, we complain because there's empty holes. They go into a grocery store and there's no food. There's no, they depended on the missionaries, on people bringing food around. It's gone. You can't come to our country no matter what. Famines have reached an all-time high. Luke mentions famines in his account. So does Mark. So famines is a sign of the end is near. The beginning of sorrows, we're here. You know, interesting thing if you read the Bible and you read Revelation, not all of the world, not all of the world is going to be starving or hungry. I'll bring you to Revelation 18. A passage, a chapter that talks about what we call Mystery Babylon, where the beast and the harlot have joined together, created their union. But I pulled out this verse here I wanted you to see. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. They become rich. So what's going on here? If famines is a sign of God's coming back and his return, the beginning of sorrows, yet here we have Mystery Babylon in luxury. I think what we're seeing, what we clearly see and you hear in the news is this, the poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer. And so you see that pulling apart and here's where the the draw will be is the Antichrist, the false prophet, the mystery Babylon will be luring through immoral, through blasphemy, through you rejecting Christ and God. Come over and enjoy the wealth of what we have to offer. And sadly, many will. So we're seeing this polarization of the poor and the, and the rich even happening today. Through the pandemic, people are hoarding. They're getting wealthy. Can't help but notice certain companies in certain areas are actually benefiting. Did you notice that? 
Small, everyday businesses being crushed and unemployed and starving and can't feed their kids. And at the same time, we have these mega corporations doing what? Having their best year ever. And this is going on worldwide. We're preparing ourselves for the coming of the Antichrist, I believe. So as we look at the pandemic, consider the food shortages as leading us in that direction. Consider the changes to money coming up, the control over it, leading us in that direction. Consider the economic controls that are being placed in many places. These are all preparing us for the coming of the end, for Christ's return, moving us as a society. So that's the economic crisis. The next one, the authoritarian rule. The authoritarian rule. One thing you can't help but notice is how powerful governments have become. More powerful than I thought they would ever be. They're controlling a lot of things, whether we agree with it or not. Mandates, orders whether we agree that they're laws or not. Government is stepping up to control many aspects of our lives. They're controlling our travel. Can't go to this country, can't go to that country, even within the country. I took a trip recently and I was like, oh, I can't go here unless I have my medical paperwork with tests on it or I can quarantine myself. I can go to this city, oh, I can go over to here. No, I can't go there. You know what I mean? The government's controlling even our travel and worldwide travel. As Zion's Hope, we've had to move trips and missionary events and things like that because we can't get there. They won't let us in. They moved into a place where we thought they never would. They control who works. Well, you can work. We're going to consider you essential. Well, you're not essential. So you stay home. And that's just one of many, many examples that are going on uh, in, in our world. Is the government stepping in, in in that area? You can't work here, you can't travel there, you can't do this. Who, who's deciding what's essential and not essential? Not me, not you, not the people, not the world. It's our governments that are stepping into that role. And into the area of churches, especially, Oh, you, you can't open. You can only have 10. No, you can have 20. Well, who made up these rules? They're stepping into an area of more and more. They're grabbing the power. That's what I feel like. This, this is preparing us for the last days. A massive power grab. Now, just imagine all these countries grabbing power of their own country. Imagine if you were one person and you could grab the whole power of all of these countries? See how it's preparing us for the end? I mean, they control things like our entertainment, our sports, our movies, our way we relax. No, stay in your home. We'll feed you what we want you to be seeing. There's, and I could go on and on. But this rise of government grabbing on to every part of our lives in ways I never thought possible, is all part of the coming end. When that authority, as you can see and you know and you have heard, will be grabbed by one person. And the world is getting prepared for that. Now, when we look at government, we know this verse 13.1 from Romans. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God, and that includes ones we agree with and ones that we don't agree with. Even tyrants, dictators, all the leaders of the world are there because God has placed them there. Remember, this is God's plan. These things aren't happening by happenstance. God's allowing it and guiding it and moving us in that direction. We do have to remember that government is made up of fallible Human beings, infallible human beings will sin and do things that are against God's word. So we do have to consider this verse that Peter brought about in Acts. We ought to obey God rather than men. And this, now this calls for great discernment amongst us as Christians. 
Does God's words agree with what government says we need to do? And, and again, I'll point to our churches. And I believe that God's word says churches need to be meeting. And so we need to honor God's word and go forward despite the consequences that will happen. So we need to consider this in every decision. One of the things that's happening with government, people are getting used to having government rule their lives. Even some people are happy that they're governing their lives. And they're gladly giving up their freedom to receive that stimulus check, to get that paycheck protection program grant. Can you see how these things are making us more dependent upon government? That's part of the plan. That's part of us kowtowing or being under the rule of governments. The very few are making decisions for us. And we're voluntarily giving that over to them. And as I said, I warn you that sooner or later, one person will become, take over for the very few. I just want to read to you from Revelation chapter 13, verses 2 through 7. A passage here that talks about the rising of the beast from the, from the sea and with the Antichrist. Let me just read beginning of verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, note that, his throne and great authority. Now I want you to see that word great authority. That's important because one thing the Antichrist is he is power hungry. He wants that authority. Verse 3, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority. It's the third time we've seen it in these few verses. Given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Can you see that the characteristic or one of the main characteristics of the Antichrist when he comes is to seize power and authority? So as I look at our world today and watch the role of governments, boy, if one person could get control of the governments and kind of get a coalition of them together, that's great authority. That's great power. Are we, and I'm sure we are, being prepared for that day when we're voluntarily, as a world, handing it over, this authority, and he will gladly seize it. I think the pandemic also is showing us how technology can be used, um, things in ways that I don't like, contact tracing. Uh, you know, I've seen so many ads where you can download an app right onto your smartphone and you can find out anybody around you who's had COVID and I'm like, who's, who's, who developed this and what else are they learning about me and, you know, Oh, yeah, I, I, gladly sign up and take our app. Okay. And there's apps that will now determine your sickness. All of these things are just ways that technology could be used against us. Medical paperwork, I'm sure someday, will be on a card or maybe even a chip. Maybe on our smartphone, another app. We gladly give it to whoever's controlling that. Soon mandatory vaccines. I don't see that as a far-fetched idea. I can see that coming. More and more control the government is grabbing. And the pandemic heightens the need to track people. And all these devices, think of how many devices you have in your home that are tracking you. I think you would be surprised what the government is already doing. It's all part of the plan, part of preparing us for the coming of the end. 
brings me to the next point, a world in crisis. You can see that all these things are building one upon another. The pandemic is showing us how vulnerable we are, how helpless we really are. We're not superhuman. A little virus, and I don't want to minimize the virus, kills us, makes us panic, makes us fearful. It shows how mortal we are. You know, you would think as Christians in the world, we'd start talking about our destiny. It's not if we're going to die, it's when we're going to die. What an opportunity to speak to people about Christ. Talk to him about the coming. Talk to him about the plan. We are mortal. You are going to die. Where are you going to be when you wake up? We're fearful. We're isolated. We're being lied to. The government's seizing more and more control. The economy is collapsing. You're like, you got any more good news? It's all part of God's plan. But you know, as, as a society, one of our biggest problems, you know, is anger. Have you noticed that, how angry people are? It, it really hasn't gone with, without notice. People are talking about it. And they've been talking about it for years, but it seems like 2020 and the pandemic have escalated it. We are an angry world. I actually was chuckling when I saw this article by The Atlantic on August 25th, Anger Can Build a Better World. I'm like, really? <laughs> Perhaps stretching it, we could say righteous anger will help bring in a more righteous nation, but that's not what this article was saying. This was just talking about pure anger, destroying things, being a good thing. Have we got things upside down? I believe we do. But why are we so angry as a world? Started considering that. And even in James, we see a passage. Now, this passage is to Christians, and so it just shows us Christians fight and argue too. They get angry. But I want you to see maybe perhaps the reason. James chapter 4, verse 1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. James is looking at this and saying, you know, it's this anger, this fighting, this quarreling is all about what you want. It's your pleasure. It's self satisfaction. It's your desires. When you look across our world today, and especially in our country, and I saw a piece last night of another protest, was that righteous anger going in and walking down the street? I actually saw somebody with a dolly and a refrigerator. <laughs> a refrigerator, nonetheless. How is this good? But that's our nation. The anger, the quarreling, the fighting, it's all about t taking from me what I want. And that's a characteristic of the end times. We are heading in a way we've never been at before, I believe. The civil unrest in this country, and it's not just this country. It's every country is dealing with this kind of an issue. There was something going on in Australia last night also. Riots, protests, anger has escalated to a point. It's, a, it's creating a, a, a real problem in our world. We shouldn't be surprised, though. Matthew 24, 12, again from the Olivet Discourse. Because lawlessness will abound, and we have to say that it is, isn't it? It's abounding like we've never seen before. The love of many will grow cold. And I don't mean the emotional, sappy kind of love. I mean the love that recognizes their neighbor and their needs, the one Christ pointed to in, the, in his questioning time. When he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, that means taking care of one another. That means treating them kindly and loving and looking out for their needs. I mean, that's the opposite of what's going on today. Our world is all about me, and that's why we're angry, because we don't get what we want. Just the opposite direction of what Christ was pointing to. We are heading down that road. The anger has 
and it will escalate towards Christians. So if you're a Christian sitting in this room, you already have the bullseye on your back from Satan himself. It's just a matter of time. We've seen him go after churches. But this anger is going to come and it's going to target us in a way that we have not seen in this country anyway. Other countries have seen it, where it takes your life. And again, backing up in the Olivet Discourse, we see this. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. I put the word Christian in there so we would know who we're talking about. And then many will be offended, and the word offended really means afflicted. And they will betray one another, will hate one another. We are so close to this. Remember people saying, you're still meeting? You're still meeting as a group? You are a, what, a super spreader. They've turned the tables around. You're not very loving, you're, you're hurting. And so eventually the target's going to get bigger and bigger until they start coming at us with everything they've got to take us down. Prepare yourself, Christian, for that day. You know, all of these things that I've built upon show that we are in a world of crisis. The world is in a real crisis. Nations retreating to their own countries, yet we need a global solution because we have a global problem. That's why we call it a pandemic. But I want to read to you from Matthew 24, verse 23 through 25, beginning in verse 23. If anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. When you read those words, you get the sense that the world is looking for a solution. They're looking for a savior. They're looking for somebody, something to help them. That's why Christ is warning his people there on the mount. When they say, look, look in the mountains, look in the desert, look here, don't believe them. I mean, when Christ comes back, we won't have to look. We won't have to search for him like the world searches for solutions. It'll be pretty obvious when he comes back. But this passage, those few verses show that there's a cry in the world for help. Looking outside of themselves, a cry for relief. And again, we want to point to Australia and their protests coming to an end amidst a cry for relief from their people. They're done. They're, 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 they're done with it all. But in the same token, I see France and Germany getting ready to lock down again. I guarantee the people are crying out for help. The world is crying out for help. Who's out there to help us? Who can save us? Dr. Fauci? A vaccine? Will a vaccine save us? No. It only delays things. It may be a band-aid on a much greater wound. God is preparing us for the coming end. Who is going to come and help us? Before you answer that question, I want, you, I want to turn to Daniel. And I want to look at chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. And this is a passage where Daniel has his vision about, and I want to focus in on the fourth beast, which is the Antichrist empire that will come in the end. I won't read the whole passage to you. I'll let you do that. But I want to begin in verse 7 and capture a few main points. Daniel 7, verse 7 is where I'll begin. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Those ten horns are significant. 
significant. Those ten horns, as we'll see in a moment, represent ten kingdoms, ten kings, ten countries. Verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So if we get that picture, we have the ten horns, we have the ten kings, we have the ten world leaders in today's words. And from those ten leaders rises the little horn, whom we all know to be the Antichrist. He will rise up, but please note, there's a coalition first of people, of leaders who have gathered together to lead the world, to solve the world's problems. In verse 21, verse 21, 721 of Daniel, we can see the hatred that they have for Christians. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings, ten kings or ten world leaders who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall rise after them. He'll be different from the first ones. He shall subdue three kings. So, so get the picture here. You got, you got ten kings rising up, taking a position in the empire. The little horn coming up, subduing, meaning wiping out three of them. We, there's a disagreement, obviously, or a power struggle. Remember, the little horn wants power, absolute power and authority over the world. And he, verse 25, speaking to the Antichrist, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and he shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half time. So th these, this group, he's going to change things in the world, not for the better. This Antichrist, this group, so as we look around at our world today, we look at groups rising up, or at least I am. You know, you looked at the World Health Organization. Are they the group? No. Are they a foreshadowing of a group? Because here's a, here's a World Health Organization trying to solve the world's problems, trying to unite the world against the disease because they realize we need a global response. Even if the U.S. came up with a vaccine and solved the U.S., it, it's a pandemic, it's a worldwide problem. So we look around this world to see, are there any groups gathering together? And there are, here and there, but there's gonna be one group in particular that's gonna try and gather together, nations gathering together, We've got our eyes on the Middle East right now. I hope you do as we're looking at the peace treaties going on. Perhaps there we'll see something happen. Perhaps elsewhere, there, there are all kinds of groups rising up to solve, but keep our eyes open. This pandemic is pushing us hard in a way that we need global solutions. We need a global commitment, a global unification to solve this problem setting the table for that antichrist to just grab one of those groups and then rise up from within and seize the power for himself. And if we look at 2 Thessalonians, a very familiar passage here as it talks about the antichrist, it calls him the lawless one. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. With all powers signs, and lying wonders. He will deceive the world with his actions and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Pandemic is pushing us in that direction, I believe. In many ways, we've seen the preparation, the groundwork 
through all the different things that I've mentioned over these three sessions. But we're looking for, and I want to highlight right here, a world savior. A world savior. Someone who has the answers to save the world's problems. Who can come in and save the economy? Who can come in and calm the fears? Who can come in and make us content? And who can come in and institute a government for the entire world? But first, I know you think in Christ, but first there will be an antichrist. With all the lies, with all the miracles, with all the deceptions to lay before the world. And the world will do what? Hand over the power. Hand over the key to the world as he will be the savior. That will come first. Christians beware. Christians beware of who's coming up. Remember, Christ warned us when they say look, in the desert, don't go. When they say, look here, don't go. I'll tell you where to look. Look up there when he comes back. Then, but remember, the false Christ, the Antichrist will come first. Well, that brings me to the final point, the parousia. This is the one we're waiting for, right? This will be the fun one when Christ comes back. And Christian, you will be lifted out of here in a, what, a twinkling of an eye. Christ will come back, and we will be with him forever. I, I love the way he eases and starts to close out the Olivet Discourse. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the earth, all the tribes, they will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look up in the sky. You will see him. You don't need to search for him. You don't need to go out in the desert. You don't need to go here. You don't need to go look under rocks. You don't need to do anything. He will come to you, and we will see him and be with him forever. We're, looking, we're not looking for a miracle vaccine. We're looking for a miracle savior. We know we have to go through some tough times. This pandemic has exposed a lot of those tough times and has opened our eyes to things that could happen in the future and escalate in the future and be used by the Antichrist. We saw how the authority we just grant to government how the Antichrist will seize governments worldwide and use it to his desires. But that's only the Antichrist. Christ will come. He will bring true salvation. He will bring true government. He will bring righteousness. He will bring justice. He is truth and he will reign. I do want to leave you with one verse before we close. Hebrews 10, verse 24 to 25. And again, this is one we've used to, and this is why it's so important to keep meeting and gathering together as, as saints. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love. Because how it's so hard by yourself. How do you stir up love by yourself? You can't. And, and, and love is action. It's doing things. That's why it's connected to stir up love and good works helping each other, being with one. It's just the opposite of the anger we see in the world today. I mean, this is one of the reasons we get attacked. We should stand out. We should be so different than what we see in people around the world. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. How relevant today. But exhorting. That word can, has a lot of meaning behind it. It's strengthening, it's warning, it's encouraging, it's, it's all kinds of things. It's admonishing. One. It's just got packed with all kinds of... But it's about one another. Exhorting one another. And so much more as the day. This version capitalizes day, and I don't have a problem with that because I know what that day is. That's the parousia. That's the coming of Christ. We have to do it even more so. Why? Because times will get really difficult. It'll be really hard in this world. As Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, difficult times, perilous times. It'll be a hard time for Christians to live in. So we need to be together. We need to be encouraging one another. Oh, they may come and try and break up this group. But that still doesn't mean we can't meet. 
and get together and encourage one another and look for the day that Christ comes. That'll be the day that I'm looking forward to. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. As we examine your word and then look out into the world, we can see the pieces coming together. We can see the preparation that you're doing for the coming of your son. We know what's going to happen. You told us beforehand. So Lord, prepare our hearts to be strong, to stand firm. Prepare us as a people to encourage and exhort and lift up and pray for one another. Lord, please come. Come soon. And we thank you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.